Claude von Clausewitz was a former Prussian general who defeated Napoleon and is considered a legend among military strategists. A year after his death in the 1830s, his iconic book On War was published. Till date, On War continues to be one of the most definitive guides on military strategy and how to win wars. Clausewitz had a very simple dictum. Wars are often won not by the biggest or the strongest army, they are won by those who have the strongest will. Clausewitz says that moral factors like the strength of character are the ultimate determinants in war. His blunt claim is this, once you've destroyed your enemy's will to fight, then you have won the war. That brings us to the question, this current Russia-Ukraine war seems to have reached a stalemate. Neither side is in a position to declare victory. After initial reverses and a failure to capture Kiev and other key cities, Russia seems to be making incremental progress in the east, in Donbass. On Crux Decode, is it possible that Russia, despite being the stronger power, may lose this war, or at the very least, may have to settle for limited Gains. Is it possible that Ukraine, much like the Taliban and the Viet Cong before it, with much smaller armies, ends up defeating a much bigger power? Military history is replete with breakdowns of large and powerful armies. Last summer, for example, the Afghan armed forces collapsed amid weak governance and extreme corruption. The Taliban had literally got a free run. So have other large or well-equipped armies, the demoralized Russian army back in 1917, which brought an end to World War I. And of course, eventually, it led to the Russian Revolution. The outmaneuvered French army during World War II in 1940. There was the British army in Singapore in 1942. And of course, the weakened South Vietnamese army in 1975 and the Iraqi army in 2014. Despite incremental gains in eastern Ukraine, a Russian military collapse cannot be ruled out. Russian forces could suffer a catastrophic defeat, almost similar to that of Egyptian President Gamal Abdul Nasser and his army in the Six-Day War in 1967. Remember, in that war, not only did Israel win in just six days, but more than 80% of Egypt's military material was lost. Now, one central theme to these fiascos which I just outlined was a lack of cohesion in military institutions, poor governance records and corruption, as well as popular unwillingness by the people at large to defend the state. Now, military theorist Karl von Clausewitz, back in the 19th century, he had emphasized on sound relationships between the army, government, and society. Those arguments appear just as valid today as they were 200 years ago. The Soviet Union itself has tasted this defeat back in the 1970s at the hands of the Taliban. The Taliban was simply a guerrilla army funded by the United States at that time taking on a more powerful Soviet Red Army. The reason why they succeeded against the odds was because their fighters were far more motivated and far more ideologically driven than the Soviet Army. In the Taliban's case, it was for a religious identity. In the case of Ukraine, they're fighting for the Ukrainian national identity. The Ukrainians feel that if they were to lose this war, it will not just be a military defeat, it's going to lead to the collapse of the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian identity as we know it. Russia, on the other hand, can still afford to lose this war. It may be a loss of face for Putin, all right, but Russia as a nation will still continue to exist. And this is despite the crippling sanctions that Western countries have put on it. But a Russian military collapse might have several implications. Now, first, it might encourage Western countries to boost, train and equip programs in other countries that are close to Russia. In Ukraine, this effort seems to have helped 
it adopt more flexible and more successful tactics that are working better on the ground. Second, the collapse could also cause Western intelligence analysts to re-evaluate the estimates of vulnerability of the Baltics as well as Eastern Europe to Russian aggression. Against a Russian army that may be weaker than once thought, Baltic countries might consider defense options that go beyond the current posture. And number three, Western militaries may sharply increase their stock of weapons, which have worked so well in Ukraine so far, whether it's portable anti-armor or anti-air assets, but which have been consumed in larger numbers than expected. But there is one critical difference between the examples that I cited earlier and Putin's Russia, modern-day Russia. Russia is a nuclear weapon state. And in history, there are no examples of a nuclear weapon state losing a conventional war against a conventional army. Unlike Egypt or Vietnam or any other example that I cited a moment ago, Putin possesses a large and diverse nuclear arsenal. And that is an arsenal that he often touts and has ambiguously threatened to use in the Ukraine war if Russia's existential interests are threatened. But that has not deterred Ukraine or the West from opposing Russia's invasion. A Russian military failure in Ukraine might give the West more confidence to challenge its aggression elsewhere. Now, this is despite Moscow's nuclear high-end weaponry. This would also not be the first time. Remember, the United States confronted a nuclear-armed USSR both back in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Russia may understand better than the West that its weak conventional forces might not enable it to effectively exploit any opportunities in Ukraine that a nuclear strike might create. In conventional or even in the unlikely nuclear escalation scenario, the West might consider keeping its negotiating powder dry until the military outcomes become clearer in focus.